I think I'd start with uh, something of a testimony. You don't know me very well, and it will do no harm at all for me to remember how it all began. My parents started to take me to Yardleywood Baptist Church, just down the road from where we lived, when I was about five. Well, this was the early 1960s. My parents had married a few years previously and were part of that never-had-it-so-good generation. And I'm sure the little church was a bit old-fashioned. And to cut a long story short, they stopped going. But they kept sending me. And I joined the boys' brigade. And that meant every Wednesday evening and uh, every Sunday Bible class. And my dad uh, insisted that I kept on going along. Uh, one illustration of the gap between them and the church was, well, I remember when I was about nine or ten, dad got a new car. I always remember it. It was a Vauxhall Victor 2000. White, black leather interior, um, mahogany veneer dash, double headlights, white wall tires, coat bottle shape, a very American looking vehicle, double headlights, the works. He was doing quite well at work at the time and uh, our lifestyle was, well, shall we say, as uh, Harold Macmillan said, never had it so good. He used to sweep into the church car park and uh, drop me off for the boys' brigade and uh, on Sundays. And you can perhaps imagine the contrast. I was quite proud of my dad and his new car and enjoyed making the other boys envious. For they got dropped off by their dads in mostly Morris Oxfords and Austin Cambridges in dark grey and green. All this is to illustrate that I didn't grow up in a church home, but I was always encouraged to go. Much later on, when I went into the ministry, I used to joke to mom and dad that uh, it was largely their doing. I'm not quite sure they agreed. Anyway, I came to faith when I was about 16 and uh, was baptized, and then two things happened. The first thing that happened was that I had just started an engineering apprenticeship in a big Birmingham factory, and somebody, I forget who it was now, told me that the first thing I should do after I got baptized was to tell somebody. So um, uh, somewhat nervously, I'd grown up in a, a sheltered home, and uh, there I was mixing it with all these lads from Birmingham, and um, I thought, well, well, I will try and tell somebody. So I took one companion aside. We used to meet for fish and chips before evening class. And uh, I told him very carefully that I had become a Christian and that I intended to tell one or two other people, but please keep it quiet. And he promised. The next morning, when the hundred or so apprentices gathered before work began in the training center, he announced... Listen, everybody, Dockers got religion, which made for an interesting few years, I can tell you. The second thing that happened was that me and my Christian friends began to go to Youth for Christ and Youth Quake meetings all over, and we attended prayer meetings and rallies. This was at the beginning of the so-called charismatic movement in this country. And just about everybody was talking about the gifts of the Spirit. You know, speaking in tongues and words of prophecy and signs and wonders and all those things. And we got this idea, in fact we were encouraged to think in these terms, that becoming a Christian wasn't quite enough. You had to be filled with the Spirit. One time a group of us went to a rock musical called Rolling Stone put on by a band called The Sheep, who um, were part of the Jesus people in California. And they looked and sounded like hippies because, well, that's what they had been before they came to Jesus. And after the concert, the uh, members of the band came round to, uh, to the audience, and one of them, a big bear of a man with a long flowing beard and... Um, uh, a ponytail and a multicolored coat, a sort of a Joseph style coat, I suppose you would say, uh, affixed on me. And he made a beeline for me. And um, he said, Are you? And there I was in my, my straight trousers and my, uh, my jacket and tie and um, my Mac and my shiny shoes. 
from a sheltered home. Just about as far from looking like a hippie as it was possible to get. And he came over to me and he said, are you a Christian? And uh, I replied, as I recall, with typical English reserve, well, yes, I think I am. Hmm, I'm not trying to do the accent, said the bear of a man. Are you? Are you sure? Well, yes, I'm sure I am, I said. Not feeling at all sure. Yes, he said, but are you filled with the Spirit? I can't remember how it ended. But I do remember going round in agonies for weeks afterwards, wondering if I was really, fully, completely a Christian. One of the main signs that you were filled with the Spirit, we were told, was that you would speak in tongues. And we didn't. Uh, we went to prayer meetings and all sorts of things which promised that if we went, we would speak in tongues, but actually it didn't happen, as I recall. And the level of intensity faded away in time. But the best thing I remember was a church leader of some kind saying, well, I'm filled with the Spirit, but I leak. Anyway, I don't remember, um, not once in those days, anybody ever talking about the fruit of the Spirit comes of elevating experience above the word, I guess. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Nobody spoke about those things at all. If only they had... I remember the angst at not being able to speak in tongues. I remember a dear Christian lady in our church, great at welcoming people, lovely in every way, kind, always ready to help, going through agonies of doubt and guilt because she didn't speak in tongues. But I never remember anyone ever saying to her, you must already be filled with the Spirit because we can see the fruit of the Spirit at work in you. Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Against such things, there is no law. No argument, really. When you see them, you know them, all overlapping and uh, overflowing with joy, the very nature of God. Paul contrasts this fruit with the fruit of human nature. Immorality, indecency, jealousy, anger, ambition, making enemies, etc., etc., etc. And it's tempting to think that love, joy, peace, patience, etc., etc., gentleness, are to be seen amongst Christians as if the church everywhere is a striking example of such fruit in a naughty world. But don't forget, Paul warns the Galatians against drunkenness, orgies, jealousy, witchcraft. It's a technical argument. But he seems to be suggesting that they do such things in the church, remember, because they are slipping back into the law. You might just as well say they do such things because they're slipping back into only being human. Because maybe, like us way back, we found it hard that we belong to accept that we belonged to Christ because we thought there had to be something more. Are you a Christian? Are you sure? Sounds a bit like the serpent in Genesis, doesn't it? Did God really say? Isn't it a tragedy that this kind of thing has bedeviled the church down all the years? Christ plus indulgences in Martin Luther's time. Christ plus respectability in so many decades of the 20th century. Christ plus you name it, pacifism, conservatism, socialism, whiteness, tongues. 
No wonder a Martin Luther had to call the church back to the heart of things. Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone, faith alone. No wonder a, a William Wilberforce had to call the church back to the heart of things. God's love is for everybody, regardless of color. No wonder Paul had to call the Galatians back to the heart of things. You foolish Galatians, freedom in Christ. Does anybody need to say of us, of you, you foolish people of world, you foolish Westonians, you foolish Christians, who bewitched you? If you look at the world around, at the harshness in Gaza, perhaps, or the hatreds being stoked in the Ukraine, you can see, writ large, the difference between the life of the flesh and the life of the spirit, between what human nature wants and what the spirit, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, produces love. Joy, peace, patience, faithfulness, goodness, kindness, all the rest, gentleness, self-control. Do I need to talk much about gentleness? We've heard quite a lot already this morning. We've experienced gentleness in the singing and in the words. It is something that is often translated humility. But we know it well enough when we see it or perhaps when we see its opposite, harshness in a Gaza hospital, harshness in a government statement. I heard this week about a letter sent from the Foreign Office to a six-year-old girl, six girl in Africa explaining why she wouldn't be allowed to join her mother in this country. Her mum had applied for her to join her, having been invited to come here and teach. And the letter said, your mother knew what she was doing when she came to the UK to work. To a six-year-old girl. Harshness. Gentleness. Proverbs. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Gentleness. Be gentle with one another. That story Alan told us last week about David and Absalom and Ittai. The king commanded them, be gentle with Absalom. Gentleness. We know it when we see it. One more thing. You know that song, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon the little child. A song that has been much mocked in recent years for giving a one-sided picture of Jesus. Not acknowledging his toughness. Not acknowledging the harsh words he had for his critics. But by golly, if Jesus hadn't been gentle with me, I might never have come to him in the first place. I might never have entered the ministry. With you. With all of us, we need God to be gentle with us, don't we? We're often our own worst enemy. The world sinks under the weight of self-condemnation, self-doubt, selfishness. And what happens? The more we condemn ourselves, the more we cast round for scapegoats, those terrible homeless people those horrible foreigners, those nasty asylum seekers. That, I think, is what the desire of the human nature amounts to. Never mind the sexual stuff. What about prejudice, hatred, warfare? Paul talks about this quite a lot. Envy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, party intrigue. Gentleness. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, says Jesus, 
for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Gentleness. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. Gentleness. By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. That is Christ. and He's ours and we are his. And he loves us as we are. And he calls us to be completely humble and gentle, and patient, bearing with one another in love. As Paul says in Philippians, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Today is, I always used to follow the church year at Tyndale, the third Sunday before Advent. We finish with a prayer. Lord, be gentle with us. You who love us so much in Jesus. And help us always to be gentle with one another and others. And from the lectionary, a prayer for today. God, our refuge and strength, bring near the day when wars shall cease and poverty and pain shall end. That earth may know the peace of heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.